Hi. Hello. My name is Stephanie, and welcome, or if you're coming back, welcome back. Either way, I'm glad you're here, and I hope you're well. So if you've been around for a while, you know that once upon a time, I had three very long videos about 365 Days Trilogy by Blanca Lipinska, which, to greatly oversimplify it, is a mafia romance about a woman named Laura who gets kidnapped by a mafia boss, <laughs> as my description would suggest, while on vacation, you know, as that sometimes happens. It's significantly more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. Recently, I was talking to the friend whom I blame for me reading that series in the first place about how I was trying to redo those three videos into a single, probably excessively long one, and just reminiscing with them about the truly unhinged saga that is 365 Days and she proceeded to tell me about a Disney World billionaire romance novel that she read recently. And listen, what was I supposed to do after she said those words? Not immediately open the Libby app and read it? <laughs> so today, we're talking about The Fine Print by Laura Asher, the first book in the Dreamland Billionaire series. So spoilers for The Fine Print and content warning for suicidal ideation, child neglect, and substance abuse. So let's look at The Fine Print. That's terrible. I'm leaving it in. As always, first the technical stuff. And to get this out of the way, I love this book. Okay? I loved it. Must a book be good? Please imagine the air quotes. Is it not enough for the thinly veiled CEO of Disney World to learn that workers deserve rights through the power of love? No, really. And honestly, I've read so much terrible romance that maybe the bar is in hell, but this was a fun time. As far as the technical scuff goes, the fine print is okay. The pacing isn't super consistent. In my opinion, the book is overly long. It's almost 500 pages, and it definitely feels that long, especially toward the end. The dialogue is a bit of a mixed bag. Some of it is totally fine, some of it is really good, and some of it is unintentionally hilarious. One point when our two main characters are on a haunted mansion ride that is totally not the haunted mansion, but it, it totally is, when they are on a ride together and get jump scared and the female main character like yells out, our male main character straight up tells her, maybe I just like hearing you scream, sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> But apart from that, the characters are all really solid. Even the side characters all have distinct personalities and get development. Although they do fall a little into that trope where they're kind of only here to exist as cheerleaders for the main couple, but that's not all they are, and some of them actually have some pretty interesting arcs of their own. This book knows what it's about and has a good time with it, and I was here for it. So on to the story. So the fine print follows Rowan Kane, one of three brothers who are the heirs to the massive Kane family empire, which includes hotels, production companies, resorts, and Dreamland, a massive fairy tale theme park in Florida based on their various IPs. And Rowan is, to be kind of blunt about it, Rowan is kind of a jerk. He's very handsome, very business savvy. He started a streaming service that made the company even more boatloads of money but he's also very cold and very closed off, and that manifests as him just being straight up rude to people. The Kane Empire, if you will, was run and founded by Rowan's grandfather, Brady Kane, who had an accident a few years ago and has been in a coma ever since, so for about two years at this point. And he has recently passed away. R.I.P. Brady Kane, you would have loved Genie Plus. <laughs> Rowan was incredibly close to his grandfather growing up. His mother died of cancer when he was very young and lost in his grief, which, make no mistake, that still isn't an, an excuse, but this is what happened. His father slipped into alcoholism and became neglectful and verbally abusive to his three sons, especially Rowan, because he was more drawn to the arts rather than sports and the like, and was very and he was a very talented artist. But due to his father's cruelty, Rowan hasn't drawn anything in years and doesn't believe in love because he saw that losing his mother destroyed his father and turned him into a cruel, belligerent drunk who mistreated his children. So Rowan is understandably very cynical when it comes to love. He also has, you know, some pretty significant trauma related to love because the first time he ever slept with someone in college... They recorded him without his consent because of the family he came from and blackmailed his family into paying for the sex tape. 
That is absolutely vile and disgusting. And Rowan has some pretty significant and understandable hesitation when it comes to love and romance and things of the like. That doesn't give him an excuse to treat people the way that he does, but, you know, that's why he is the way that he is. After the funeral, pretty soon after, actually, Rowan and his brothers attend the will reading where they are given letters from their grandfather with a task they need to complete within a specific time frame in order to get their inheritance. One of his brothers needs to get married and have a child, truly unhinged behavior on Grandpa's part, honestly, and Rowan has to serve as director of the Dreamland Park for six months during which he has to make a significant improvement to the park that has to be approved by a committee that will be chosen by Brady. But if he can't, his father, his father's name is Seth, will inherit everything. And Rowan hates his father, understandably so, so he's not about to let that happen. But Rowan also hates Dreamland. His mother loved the park and he has tons of wonderful memories from there, but after she died and the family fell apart and their father started drinking and ignoring them, those memories end up being tainted by what came after. But again, as much as he hates Dreamland, he hates his father more, so off to Florida he goes, uh, from Chicago. As someone whose main motivator is spite, I get that. <laughs> So once in Florida, Rowan calls a meeting of all the Dreamland employees to introduce himself as the new director, but to also get a feel for things, so he kind of hides in the back of the auditorium they're in to listen to the meeting and the employees around him. And listen, <laughs> listen, as someone who worked food service and retail and customer service for many years, there is no way in hell that the employees wouldn't have immediately clocked Rowan as being from corporate. It's a sixth sense you develop throughout your time working these jobs, and he's not subtle about it. So he listens to the meeting and thinks about how much he hates Dreamland <laughs> and its various employees. Enter Zara, our second POV character and the love interest for this whole thing. And she so shows up to the meeting late with a pink skateboard, a bunch of ear piercings, totally out of dress code, quirky enamel pins all over everything she owns, and literally trips and falls into Rowan's lap. That last bit is very much giving shoujo manga, and I'm not mad about it. And to give credit where it's due, this is a good character introduction. We get a decent sense of who Zara is from this brief little moment where we meet her. And now I can already hear you. Oh, she's just a manic pixie dream girl here to fix Rowan in. Yeah, honestly, maybe a little. But she's also a character in her own right, with her own growth and her own arc. And also, to be blunt about it, justice for the manic pixie dream girl, I said what I said. So while Rowan is annoyed by her, how dare one of his below minimum wage employees be late and show up in jeans, he's also kind of enamored by her and is super normal about it. She's beautiful in a way that makes it difficult to refocus my attention on the conversation at the front of the room. I hate it, yet I can't look away. My eyes trace the curves of her body, drawing a path from her delicate throat to her thick thighs. <laughs> That's embarrassing to read out loud. The speed of my heart picks up. I clench my hands into two fists, disliking the lack of control I have over my body. Get a hold of yourself. Listen, listen I'm going to be so for real with you. As someone who has read Fifty Shades of Grey, the fic from which it came, Master of the Universe, after an its fic... The 365 Days Trilogy, and to a lesser extent, The Master, also by E.L. James, I, I would not in good conscience recommend any of those. I was ready for Rowan to be like the main male love interest, please imagine the sarcastic air quotes, from those. That he was going to actively stalk Zara and threaten her and gaslight her and be violent with her. It was giving very much, I've seen this film before and I didn't like the ending, you know? But to my pleasant surprise, which is probably a sign I need to read better books, it doesn't go that way. Rowan is extremely out of touch with his emotions. It seems like he basically had to shut them off when he lost his mother to protect himself from being hurt further. And this makes him kind of a jerk and is definitely not an excuse for the way he treats people around him. But he never goes full Christian Grey or hardened Scott, which was a pleasant surprise. Like I said, the bar is in hell. Zara is very much the opposite of Rowan because <laughs> of course she is. Listen, I like this book. I really do. And it's not subtle 
by any means. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm just putting it out there that it's not very subtle. She is very, very friendly, very kind, very outgoing, very personable. She works as a stylist at the Princess Kara Salon, which is the Dreamland equivalent of the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique, and has been working at the park since college, as does most of her family. But her real dream is to be a creator, again, the Dreamland equivalent of an Imagineer. But she doesn't feel that she's good enough. Because as seemingly happy and outgoing as Zara is, and this book is a grumpy ex-sunshine romance and it kind of beats you over the head with it. <laughs> like I said, this book isn't subtle and that's not necessarily a bad thing, like I said, but it's, it's not subtle. But as outgoing and happy as Zara seems, like I said, she really, really struggles with her self-confidence. But Rowan, being the super normal guy that he is, sees this happy person and is like, oh, this is a bit. She's hiding something. <laughs> something about the look on her face that has my heart racing faster in my chest. Beautiful, carefree, innocent. Like, she's actually happy with her life rather than faking it like the rest of us. Sir, are you good? Just kind of an aside, Rowan has some really unintentionally funny dialogue in this book. It's not grim dark exactly, but it's trying really hard to be grim dark and just ends up being kind of funny. So during the meeting, they make references to big changes that are coming from corporate, to which Zara makes a kind of sarcastic comment about that because, as we all know, that never means anything good for those of us below minimum wage. Rowan takes this very personally and whips around like, oh, so you have a problem with corporate? Again, sir, this is a Wendy's. And if she didn't realize he was corporate before, she would have now. But for plot reasons, she doesn't. But Zara explains that they have been getting screwed over by corporate lately, especially these last few years since Brady has been in a coma. Their health insurance benefits are outrageously expensive and barely cover anything. The pay is terrible, so much so that a lot of Dreamland workers actually have to work second and even third jobs just to survive. They get little time off and unpaid vacation days. The hours are overly long and disproportionate to what they're being paid. And the a mandatory overtime is unpaid. And Zara puts it perfectly. It doesn't take a genius to draw conclusions based on how they treat us. And how's that? Like we don't matter as long as we make them billions of dollars a year. Honestly, I really like that the fine print not only address this, but that it plays a pretty significant role in the story, which came as a very pleasant surprise to me. I was absolutely here for it, because there is very much a poverty crisis in the theme park industry. They are unpaid, get few if any benefits, many are unhoused, and often have to work multiple jobs just to scrape by. This is not unique to the theme park industry. Sadly, it's true of many of them, including the one that I work in. Now that I have thoroughly bummed us all out, back to the story. We find out that a lot of these things, these issues they've been having since Brady was in a coma, the low wages, the unpaid overtime, the bad benefits, were decisions that Rowan made as a cost-cutting measure, and he's genuinely confused as to why Zara is upset by them. And at this point, I was like, oh god. Is there going to be a union uprising subplot in this billionaire romance? Let's do this. Sadly, it never goes that far. But again, I like that this was a significant part of the novel, and there's some great discussion about these issues that take place within it. Rowan and Zara have a bit of a back and forth when it's announced at the meeting that he's the new director. And while she laughs it off, internally, she's horrified. Because she spent her entire time at this meeting arguing with not just her new boss, but the boss uh, of everybody, the boss's boss, right? And as she heads to her shift at the salon, she's worried that she's going to be fired, and uh, that's an understandable worry. This concern is only compounded when Rowan shows up at the salon, which if you're not familiar with the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique, it's a place where kids can get makeovers to look like fantasy characters, princes, princesses, knights, etc., where Zara and her friend Claire work. And just as an aside, I love Claire. She's a fun character, and I wish we'd gotten more of her. They've worked there since college, though Claire wants to work as a chef. Dreamland apparently has a Michelin star restaurant in one of their parks, which is wild. The openings are few and far between, and she hasn't been able to get her foot in the door. 
And it's here that I know that Lauren Asher has at some point worked in customer service because we learned that Zara's boss has one-sided beef with her. If you've ever worked in retail or food service or any kind of customer service, you know that sometimes you'll have a random older coworker that just hates you for no reason and has one-sided beef with you. I don't know why, but it just happens. <laughs> And it has been looking for an excuse to get rid of her, but because Zara is good at her job, there's not a lot she can do. But when Rowan starts stalking around, this might be her opportunity to finally get rid of Zara. But the one-sided beef isn't quite as random as it initially seems, because her boss is her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend's mom. Now, we learn all this throughout the book, but it's relevant to mention here. Zara was in a long-term relationship and what seems to be a very, very toxic one with a man who also worked at Dreamland named Lance. Lance constantly gaslit her, body shamed her, and cheated on her with her boss's daughter, which is especially low. And on top of that, he stole her ride idea and submitted it as his own. Every year, Dreamland opens up an employee design contest where they can submit ride ideas, land ideas, parade ideas, anything you can think of, right? And Lance stole Zara's design for a space-themed land called Nebula Land, which she actually started working on with Brady himself because, you know, as terrible as Rowan is with employee relations, Brady was really, really good at it and had a lot of really good relationships and rapport with his employees, even the folks responsible for the day-to-day -day running as of the park, right? And Zara's dream has always been to be a creator, and she had a lot of really good ideas, which she would often share with her significant other, as you do. And Lance stole her idea. This was after Brady's accident and him being in a coma, so he didn't know that it was stolen and submitted or he would have recognized it as Zara's. It got submitted to the design contest and won. Scumbag behavior, truly. Thankfully, she kicked him to the curb, but she's put her dream of being a creator on hold because of just how awful things went with Lance and with Nebula Land. But while Rowan was skulking about because he was mad that Zara called him out on his crappy business practices, he's also very much infatuated with her and doesn't quite know how to deal with it because, again, he doesn't do emotions very well. And also his main goal is to do his six months at Dreamland, fulfill his grandfather's instructions, get his inheritance, and help ensure his older brother Cal, and not their father, ends up as the CEO. So while Dreamland is incredibly successful, they have their 50th anniversary coming up, and Rowan decides to lean into that and instructs the team that he's gathered working on a pretty significant park expansion for the anniversary. Renovations, creating new lands, new shows, new rides, new merchandise, all that. And he gives them six months to do it, which is a crazy short timeline. So to help streamline getting new ideas, they open up the employee design contest early. Do you see where this is going? When the contest is announced, Claire encourages Zara to submit something for the contest, and Zara agrees, but only if Claire agrees, to apply for a position that recently opened up in the restaurant, something she's been hesitant to do, because the last time one opened up, she had kind of a disaster of an interview before. So the two of them start drinking wine to help them get their courage up to do these things. Except Zara just gets angrier and angrier, understandably so, about what Lance did to her. And on top of that, he changed her design and made it kind of subpar. And as a result, the upcoming e-ticket ride that's going to be built in the land is cool, but it could be better. So instead of submitting a design or an idea, Zara just starts tearing the ride apart in detail. It becomes kind of a vent thing for her, which we love healthy coping, get the negative emotions out. Except because she's had quite a bit to drink, and instead of deleting what she wrote, Zara accidentally submits it. And she is convinced that this is it, right? Not only did she make a terrible first impression on the new director of the park, but she tore apart a major upcoming part of the rot of the park, right? That's going to make them millions of dollars. And when Zara gets called into Rowan's office a few days later, she's like, well, this is the end. <laughs> I had a good run. Except Rowan doesn't fire her. Hides the file over to me. Here's your new contract. It's quite similar to your previous one with the Magic Wand Salon. My mouth drops open. I'm sorry, a contract? When people are fired from Dreamland, given a contract to never come back? How exactly does this whole thing work? He sighs as if I'm inconveniencing him. You'll be joining the creator's team 
effective immediately. Oh, Zara starts her new job as a creator, designing rides, lands, parades, merchandise, etc. for Dreamland's 50th anniversary celebration. Now, it's worth noting at this point that no one knows Rowan is only here temporarily, much less that it's a stipulation of Brady's will, because he's worried about corporate sabotage, put a pin in that. The problem is that while Zara has really cool, innovative ideas, she cannot draw. Like, her stick figures look really bad. Relatable moments in literature. And after she presents her ideas for the first time, Rowan tells her, Hey, your art sucks. <laughs> But believe it or not, he's less nice about it than the joke I just made, but feels bad about making her feel bad, which is a new concept for him. He assures her that it's a problem that they can fix because he can put her in contact with a friend of his in the art department who can turn her concepts into art. A guy named Scott. <laughs> Except there is no Scott. Rowan is Scott. Like I mentioned earlier, as a kid, Rowan was very much into the arts instead of sports like his brothers, which irritated his father who berated and mocked him to the point where he gave up drawing entirely for years until now. So Zara and Scott, please imagine the air quotes, start texting and there is very much a spark there, which Zara starts to feel guilty about because she has a crush on Rowan and... <laughs> Okay, let me preface what I'm about to say by saying this. I love Zara. I really do. And I get that there needs to be a certain suspension of disbelief to move the prop forward. I get that. I, I do. I truly, truly get that. But girl, the fact that she didn't immediately know this is Rowan is kind of unbelievable to the point where it almost takes you out of the story. Which, in Zara's defense, she does point this out later. He texts the same, their personalities are very similar, she'll be working late, texting Scott about it, and Rowan will conveniently show up with snacks and with food, yet the reveal is a shock. Again, I get it for plot's sake, but man, come on. I'm going to kind of speed one through these next bits because like I said earlier, this book is overly long and you feel it, especially after the midway point and really, really feel it toward the end. So we're going to kind of hit the broad strokes for time reasons because there's some other stuff I want to say about the billionaire romance genre as a whole. So uh, just try and stay with me here. Rowan and Zara grow closer as they work together, him under the guise of Scott from the art department which leads Zara to feeling conflicted as she has feelings for Scott and Rowan, with whom she has many ideological differences, but she also gets the sense that there's more to him than the cold persona that he puts on. And in turn, Rowan starts to open up and actually enjoy things. He leaves work early and is actually interested in things besides the business. He's getting back into art and actually enjoying it, and even starts spending time volunteering at an organization that works with adults with Down syndrome, which Zara is also a part of as her sister Ani, who works at a candy store in Dreamland, has Down syndrome. Now, I cannot personally speak to the accuracy of how Ani is written, but I do love that she is a full and complete character, and she has some of the best one-liners in the book. She is hysterical. Now, while Rowan initially joined the organization to get closer to Zara, he finds that he actually enjoys it and develops a genuine friendship with Ani. And while all this is going on, Rowan is starting to realize that the way he's running Dreamland, which, while profitable for him and the other higher-ups, is actually detrimental to the people who keep the park running. He has been so successful by screwing his employees, people like Zara and Ani and Claire and his secretary. He's cut wages to the bare minimum. The health insurance they have is abysmal and expensive. Some of them, you know, have sick children and grandchildren or are going through treatments themselves and work multiple jobs just to be able to stay afloat. And many of them, Zara included, work multiple jobs just to be able to survive, while Dreamland and Rowan himself are raking in billions. And through his conversations with Ani, sadly these occur mostly off screen and I really wish we'd gotten to see more of them, you know. This book was almost 500 pages, we could have gotten that too, <laughs> but I digress. That while Dreamland is seemingly committed to diverse hiring, it's hard for people with visible disabilities to get hired, and the park as a whole has some pretty glaring accessibility issues. Most of his adult life, Rowan's whole thing has been being successful and making money. And until now, he's never realized that there are people who are paying the price for that success and how his policies and cost cutting are actually affecting them. This ends up, again, surprisingly being a not insignificant part of the book, which, like I said, was a pleasant surprise. So Rowan and Zara are getting closer and closer, and it comes to a head at an employee day at the park. And listen, this was cute. 
Okay, it was cute. Going on rides and eating food and seeing the fake snowfall. And just as an aside, this is when I realized that the fine print takes place at Christmas. Do with that what you will. It's cute. And eventually this leads to a kiss between the two. And after some back and forth and worries about HR getting involved, as well as Rowan explaining the whole pretending to be Scott thing and his issues surrounding his artistic talent. Although Zara is initially put off by the whole pretending to be Scott thing, is once he explains it, kind of understanding about the whole thing, she's better than me. I, I don't know that I would let that slide as quickly as she did, but like I said, she's better than me. The two of them start sleeping together, but agree to keep it casual, though we know it's definitely not casual and they're falling in love. Because Zara has lived in Florida all her life, she's never seen real snow, and she really, really loves the fake stuff that comes down every so often at Dreamland during their holiday celebration. So Rowan takes her to New York City to have a romantic, I mean totally casual weekend. <laughs> where she gets her to meet her favorite author, Juliana De La Rosa, who is author of what's kind of described as being a Bridgerton-esque series of books that has recently been adapted by Rowan's streaming service. They also go to Central Park and hang out in Rowan's penthouse, and this is where Zara shares her struggles with her mental health, something that had only been alluded to at this point and talks about how hard it was for her to seek help. And Rowan, in turn, shares about his father's alcoholism and his mistreatment and how traumatizing his mother's death was. And this is where Rowan starts to accept that he's falling in love with Zara and he wants to make this a serious thing. And then Zara gets sick from being out in the snow in New York City because this is a romance novel. We're back in Florida at this point, by the way. It starts out as a cold, but trickly turns into a really serious case of pneumonia. That gets so bad that when she tries to get up out of bed, she falls and hits her head and ends up getting a head injury and falling unconscious. And Rowan has to call 911 because he cannot wake her up. And he has a lot of trauma surrounding illness and hospitals after watching his mother battle cancer as a child. And he convinces himself that it's his fault Zara is sick. He took her to New York City and if they never met, she wouldn't have been there and therefore wouldn't be here in the hospital. And he absolutely cannot stand the feeling of helplessness he had when he found her unconscious. So he decides to go back to how he used to be, before loving Zara changed him and he had to deal with all these really uncomfortable emotions that he's experiencing. Is this how my dad felt when my mom was rushed to the hospital time and time again? This burning desperation to do something, yet the inability to fix anything? The thought hits too close to home. How could I have been this much of an idiot? I willingly became like my father, giving in to a woman's every whim until they took over all my thoughts and influenced my actions. I've rearranged my schedule, took nights off, attended mentorship events, and went on vacation when I should have been working. Excuse the language. Fuck. I was even willing to give up my future as CFO to stay with her at Dreamland. What the hell is wrong with me? The truth is, I became soft and easily swayed by her. And for what? To willingly subject myself to this feeling of powerlessness? Well, he is having this absolute crisis, first decides to remind Rowan that he's been a really crappy boss to his employees. Because when he asks if Zara can get a private room, the nurse says they'll see what they can do depending on her insurance. And he realizes that she has the crappy policy that he decided on for his employees. He, she being the nurse, looks down at her clipboard. Once she's stabilized, that's up to her insurance policy. Is she on your plan? Uh, he pretended to be her fiancé in order to go back into the hospital with her, you know, because they only let family back. My jaw clenches down. I have no idea what kind of insurance Zara has, let alone if they allow for private rooms. Knowing the insurance plans your employees have, do you really expect anything more? My selfishness has a way of coming back to, to bite me in the ass, and the worst part is, it's only just begun. Hopefully, Dar Zara does end up getting better, and I was a little worried Rowan was going to break up with her as soon as she regained consciousness, or that he was just going to straight up ghost her. Again, I, I read a lot of bad romance, so the bar is in hell. But he waits until she's at least a few days recovered, which is still not great, but better than I expected, so I'll take it. 
But Rowan has been distant ever since she started getting better, and Zara notices, and when she calls him out on it, he tells her that this thing between them was supposed to be casual and a way to pass the time while he was stuck at Dreamland, which is low, and really hurts her, but she's having none of it and tells him that he obviously cares about her. Hell, she knows that he loves her, which Rowan denies. And that's when he tells Zara about that his position is temporary and he's leaving in January. And this absolutely breaks her heart, hearing that he always intended to leave and that he was essentially using her to pass the time. She tells Rowan that he's selfish and cruel and she wants him to leave, which he does, after apologizing for everything that he's put her through. Cue everyone being miserable. Zara is unhappy, Rowan is unhappy, and desperately trying to convince himself that this was for the best. And his friendship with Ani breaks down, which he's seemingly confused about, which is weird, considering he broke up with her sister while she was in the hospital and told her that he was basically using her. So I don't know why he thought Ani would still be cool with him, but okay. So Rowan returns to the family home, which is close enough to Dreamland that you can see the nightly fireworks from the porch, and decides that the best way to cope with what's going on is to take down the porch swing that his mother loved to sit on and watch the aforementioned fireworks. The swing where she died in his father's arms while he and his brothers watched. Yeah, damn. And while he's taking the swing down, Rowan discovers a message carved into the wood of it that for him and his brothers that his mother left behind near the end of her life. Like it was done with a sharp knife, but the handwriting is unmistakably my mother's. My little knights, love with all your hearts and show kindness in all your actions. Mommy. And it's then that Rowan realizes that he's been a huge jerk and that the way that he's treated people to get ahead is not right. And that what he's done has been out of greed and anger and he regrets all of that, what he's done and how he's treated people. So he decides to try and fix things and start making things right. And he decides to start doing that by making things right with Zara and to try and win her back. Listen, <laughs> Listen, we love changed behavior, we love growth, we love realizations about our own behavior and taking steps to change it, but Rowan decides that the best way to do this is to corner Zara in her cubicle in the middle of the workday, not long after she comes back to work after having been ill, and confess his feelings for her, which goes about as well as you'd expect, which is to say not at all. And things only get worse when Zara goes home and finds that she has received a letter from Brady Kane, uh, posthumously, obviously, thanking her for making him see the magic of Dreamland again and offers her a place on the committee that's going to decide whether or not to accept Rowan's pitch and thus decide if he gets his inheritance. Now, Rowan has no knowledge of any of this, but Zara is now convinced that the only reason he wanted to be with her in the first place was because she was going to decide if he gets his inheritance, and she's understandably pissed about that. He had an endless stream of creators he could have hired to ensure Dreamland was in the best hands to win this vote. His reason behind pretending to be Scott seemed reasonable, but now I'm wondering if it was another play to poke around and see if I would admit to being part of the voting committee. What if his whole speech yesterday in my cubicle was a way for him to pacify me so I wouldn't screw him over? Which each question my doubts grow stronger. What if everything about us was always a lie? And at the last creator meeting before they go on ho on break for the holidays, Zara gives her pitch for making Dreamland more inclusive for guests with disabilities, which goes over really well, but Rowan is also shocked to learn that Zara put in her two weeks notice a few weeks ago and that today is technically her last day. When he confronts her about it, she confronts him about his reasons for dating her, and he swears he had no idea she'd been chosen to be one of the votes to decide his fate, but she doesn't believe him after everything, which again is understandable. And over the holiday break, Rowan returns to Chicago to see his father, finally deciding that he's spent enough of his life trying to prove himself to him, and it's time to close that chapter of his life. And he has a very conversation, a very candid conversation with him about the man he became after his mother's death and his admitted, his father's admitted regrets about that. He also tells Rowan that despite the pain of losing his wife, he'd fall in love with her again and again and never regretted their time together. Regret falling in love with my mother? Not at all. I could have sworn he would say yes. How could he not after all the pain he clearly went through? Why not? 
you'll learn that the best rewards come with the biggest consequences. There's nothing that great comes without making any sacrifices. He shuts his eyes. If a man like him would do it all over again, that's all I needed to hear. Because if he would make the same choices only to relive decades of grief, then something about love must be worth the pain. It's the final push that Rowan needs, and he breaks the news to his brothers that he's not returning to Chicago no matter what the committee decides, and that he's going to try and stay at Dreamland and make the park better, make it more in line with the vision that his grandfather had. Flash forward, it's committee day. So Rowan shows up to make his presentation to the committee, which includes his father, a few higher-ups in the company, as well as some folks from their overseas parks but also a lot of creators, a few office and admin people, and a few employees who handle the day-to-day -day running of Dreamland. And Zara learns from Martha, Rowan's secretary, who is also on the committee, that Brady was the only one who knew who would be on the committee. So Rowan had no idea that Zara would be chosen, so she realizes that he was not using her. Rowan gives him his presentation, but it's not about expanding Dreamland. Instead, he acknowledges the terrible way the company has treated their employees, how he has treated their employees, who are vital to the success and running of the park, and he proposes ma raising the minimum wage to reflect the cost of living and giving them better benefits. Not increasing our wages nor improving our company benefits, we are shamelessly giving up our best asset. Our employees are the hidden reason why we stand apart for our competitors, and it's time we treated them as such. Therefore, I stand by my choice to increase wages and reinstate benefits to preserve the future of Dreamland. Also announces his plan to stay and keep running Dreamland, and not only that, to implement Zara's plans for making the park more accessible. Zara, again, has realizes that Rowan wasn't just using her and that everything he told her he meant, tells off his father for being a garbage person, and the board approves Rowan's presentation so he gets his inheritance and the changes he made are going to be implemented. Hooray! <laughs> Rowan and Zara get back together and continue working together. The epilogue picks up three years later. Rowan and Zara are happily married with a daughter that Rowan dotes on. He's also, you know, still working on his art and has illustrated some children's books. Nebula Land, complete with Zara's original version for the big e-ticket ride, is now officially open and Zara is pregnant again. They are happy and in love and it's adorable and I love it. So, billionaire romance novels have always been an incredibly popular romance subgenre and honestly, it's easy to see the appeal. It's a life that most of us can only imagine where you never have to worry about how you're going to pay your bills or worry that the cost of an unexpected expense or a lost job could literally destroy you personally and financially. And I like that the fine print acknowledges this to an extent. A lot of conversations within the book about the mistreatment of the Dreamland employees and the way that they're exploited by not just Rowan, but by the company as a whole. They are struggling just to survive while Rowan and the company make billions of dollars. And I like that Rowan learned that the way he exploited people to get ahead was bad and that people that worked under him were, you know, people. So was the fine print kind of cheesy and not very subtle and overly long with some questionable dialogue? Yes. But you know what? It was a fun time. And I really liked that it acknowledged the issues that the theme park employees faces and the way that they were exploited by Rowan and the company. You know, I like that those things were acknowledged and that they were a significant part of the book. So yeah, was it kind of cheesy that Rowan learned that workers deserve rights through the power of love? Maybe. But it was also a fun time. <laughs> I said what I said. This book knew what it was and it had fun with it and I was here for it. I don't know if I'm going to continue the series, but if the other books pop up the, at the library, I might check them out. Who knows? But like I said, it was a good time. So thank you so much for listening to all that and until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.